where we're starting, and I'll just start babbling. <laughs> All right. <laughs> We're live with Michael Jordan fans are the best, and we have back here today Politicus Rex. How's everything doing? I heard that you had a uh, a venture this weekend. That's one way of putting it. Yes, I had a 24-hour race, running race this time. We didn't Last month was 24-hour company cycling message. race that I missed because I decided, hey, let's hit a deer instead. So. I wasn't able to make it to the start in time. So then for this one, I showed up completely unprepared. Hour and a half sleep, thanks to you. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, I, just, yeah, I, I was hurting from the very beginning. I eked out a marathon, it, technically about a half mile more than a marathon. And I just, I had to quit and just come home early mm -hmm. but you know last year i did 55 miles and i was looking to do 100 kilometers 62 and a half miles this year as a minimum but uh the training wasn't great leading up to it uh wasn't prepared the day of the race the way i should have made a lot of small mistakes that all built up against me it's just it was all my fault and uh yeah like i said eh, at least i got a marathon out of it like, yeah still sore still sore yeah i mean it's still impressive to do you know what you did even though you had wanted to do a lot more so a lot of people never do that in their life so um just do it off an hour half sleep you know and says something uh, yeah uh michael's here he says rex is back i mixed i missed him <laughs> Thank you, Michael. <laughs> so, uh, first things first. So, I put up on the video um, a picture of George Mikan and Victor Wembanyama, kind of just symbolizing the differences yeah. between the beginning of the NBA to the current NBA. When you look at those two players in a phrase, or, you know, obviously more in the phrase, but what do you think of the differences between them? But what do you think about the similarities between them? Oh, the similarities. I th the thing, the big thing about Mike and was he was the first big guy that was mobile. I'm, now, for all you in the chat and listening later on, I'm not saying he was mobile like Wemby mobile, but he was mobile. For the time, you know, mm -hmm. and he was he was six ten. Uh, I believe he was when he started in the NBA. I believe he was about two forty five. By his final year, he was two seventy. He was a big dude, broad shoulders, but uh, he had nimble feet. Once again, for the time, in the equipment that they had in the training, and he had a huge height advantage over guys of the day and back in that day you really didn't jump that much not because they couldn't i mean if you just look at the olympics of the 1950s they the high jump was still really high the long jump was still really long the sprinters were still really fast um it just was something you didn't do in a game because if you dunked on someone that was like the ultimate insult and there were no flagrant fouls. So guys would get undercut. Guys would, you know, take your legs out. They they give you the elbow and the groin while you're in the air. They, you know, they do all that type of stuff because you didn't, you know. And then you also had the thing that you couldn't hang on the rims mm -hmm. because they, you, they didn't have flex rims. Obviously, that was 30 years before flex rims. So it was a technical to wrap your fingers around the rim. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't do that. Um, 60, now after Mike, in 1964, offensive goaltending became a rule because of Wilt. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people don't realize Wilt got a lot of points when his teammates would shoot, and he'd just jump up and grab it and put it in, and it was in the cylinder. Mm-hmm. That was legal then. 1964, they made the rule, no, no, Wilt, you can't do it. So 
that that changed the whole game really because guys would get up there they made the goaltending rule the modern all goaltending rule not offensive defensive goaltending rule how it is written was written because of Mike mm-hmm. he blocked 24 shots one game by just standing under the basket and jumping up and knocking balls away. Yeah. Now, there had been goaltending rules in existence in different high school leagues, different college conferences, but there was no uniform rule across all of basketball. Mm -hmm. And Maurice Pudeloff, the first commissioner of the NBA, that, that got put in. Uh... Mike and being more mobile and bigger, but he had a brute game. Mm-hmm. Wemby is Wemby is all finesse. Wemby to me really reminds me he he is what Kareem would be if Kareem was nineteen today. Mm-hmm. And there's actually a YouTube video get, that got posted. Someone interviewed Kareem two days ago, and. Asked him about Wemby, and oh my gosh, his face lit up. And if you know Kareem's history, his face doesn't light up about anybody. Yeah, yeah. And his face lit up. He is a believer in Wemby. And that's that made me start to change my opinion. Um, Mike can completely change the game of basketball. Completely. His influence change the entire game if you and I, if you go to my channel under playlists i got uh i think it's 50 videos under the caption real basketball when basketball was looked at as a team sport period mm-hmm. and all different things size of the ball the original rules all types of stuff like that uh 30s 40s 50s 60s and if you look at the game before Mikan's influence, it doesn't even look like basketball. Yeah. It was a completely different game. Mm-hmm. And because of Mikan, you got the shot clock, which made it, it went from being a brute game, a half court, hard picks, hard fouls, pushing, grunting, shoving, you know, pushing type of game. Once the shot clock got put in, then it became a running game. Then you got to see what the pace was like in the 60s. After the shot clock got put in, and they started going crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, but my, I think Wemby might... There might be some rules, not rules just outright change but there might be rules that get tweaked because yeah. of him he had a couple moves that i saw just today and i think they were from the last game he he mishandled the ball at the top of the key off a pass gets control of it on the dribble he doesn't do what all other big men do which is just grab it and pick it up yeah he continued the dribble got a handle did a crossover, went straight down the middle between two defenders and dunked it, starting from out three-point line. Yeah. If he starts doing that on a regular basis, like that ends up being just a thing that the defenses can't stop. So they resort to just, you know, pounding him once he gets in there. They're going to make, they're for his own safety and for the, the game, they're going to end up, going a bit backwards on the first step rule Mm -hmm. about picking up your your first step and they're really going to start calling it tight on him just to slow him down that split second yeah so he doesn't have that crazy advantage but yeah his shot i don't know what he's shooting percentage wise right now but i noticed that his his shot his feet are always very stable. Yeah. Which is something that you always try and get young kids to do. Mm-hmm. And it's all—it's usually the hardest thing for young kids to do. 
And I don't know if it's because of his size, if he has really worked on it or what, but I notice every time that he shoots, his feet are almost always, unless he's getting contact, obviously, they're always in the same position. He's very consistent with his foundation, which always leads to good percentage. Yeah. So that's something. His free throw form is fantastic, Mm -hmm. which for a big man is very rare. Very rare. I mean, you look at his free throw form, he looks like a guy 6'7". To be honest with you, he... His game, and I made this comment on a a post earlier, to me, if you look at his game, his shot, how he shoots, his moves, and where his spots on the floor, it's exactly like Manu Ginobili. Okay. He's he's like a 7-3-7-4 right-handed Manu Ginobili. Uh He's, he's, He's shooting the same shots from the same places that Manu did. Now, I'm thinking that is a purposeful, that that's something Pop is doing purposefully. Yeah. Um, but his lateral, the difference, Mike had lateral movement from the post position with his back to the basket. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, the greatest ever at that, and it was Hakeem. Yeah. Hakeem's lateral quickness with his back to the basket is unmatched. Mm-hmm. Wemby's lateral quickness is facing the basket. If he develops a back to the basket game, then it, it's going to be ridiculous. Yeah. You know, he's going to be averaging, you know, close to a point a minute at that point because the, the, the plays that Pop has always ran, what you'll see is the high screen and roll, Wemby coming off to the left. He'll spot up, take the shot because who's going to block him? If you overcommit with a big man, he's going to be slower. He's going to do the pump fake. He's going to go down the lane, and before you can react with his reach, he's already going to be at the rim. If you overplay on the pass, he's going to roll to the post, and then you're going to see a sky hook that no one's going to be able to block. No. So the options off that one roll are going to be ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And the shot, one thing you have to look at when a person's in a person's repertoire is how many shots, like you have guys that are scorers. Mm -hmm. You have guys that are shot makers. Yeah. Kobe was a shot maker. Mm -hmm. You know, Dominique was a shot maker. Bird was a shot maker. Then you have guys that are scorers. Guys like Adrian Dantley that they have a repertoire that is not extremely varied. They got four or five moves. You know you're getting one of those moves, but... His level of execution is so high, he's just getting it in the hole. Yeah. And then he'll get fouls, and he'll ring up 10 free throws. Mm-hmm. You know, they just score points. Yeah. You know, Jordan, when he came in the league, was a scorer. He just scored points. A lot of dunks, a lot of layups, a lot of double, triple pump, a lot of fast break. He just got points. Later on, in the 90s, he became a shot maker. You started seeing that fade away. You started seeing the pull up to the left off off the dribble. And he start he started to become a shot maker. Mm -hmm. He had, you know, you you couldn't move him anywhere on the court. He could make shots from everywhere is what he was at the end. Yeah. He didn't start that way. If if Wemby becomes a shot maker in his mid twenties, then if he has no severe injuries, it's going to be rough for the league to to stay with that, because the number of the number of possible shots, different shots, he can put up in a three to five second span, which is basically what you get, you know, with the shot clock. You come down, you run through your offense, you have your first 
your first phase where you try and get the quick bucket if you can. If it's not there, then you run an offensive set that's geared towards a certain end of, a certain player, which will be him. And then if you know if nothing's there, being a young player, you, you always tell them if you don't get the the shot that we're working for, you kick it back out, you reset it. You got about eight seconds on the clock, and then you got some. You know, you got a, a plan B. Yeah. But if he becomes a shot maker early enough in his career that you don't need a plan B, that he has his own plan B, the first phase of the offense goes to him and he is able to make a decision on four or five different shots that are available to him on one side of the court, that, that that's gonna be that's gonna be crazy. Because if he draws a, a double team all the way towards the three-point line, which for him is still two steps from the basket. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're opening up the entire weak side. If they if they just get, I mean, you could bring back, you know, Robert Ory at 50 years old, you'll be able to hit that weak side three. <laughs> yeah. Let me, uh, let me address the, uh, the chat real fast. Um, and then I got a couple of questions for you about what, what you were saying. Uh, Michael says, people back then thought tall people were awkward and could not move. Michael says Wemby is shooting 49%. And can American culture in sports become about winning again, Rex? Um, uh, but if uh, before, uh, if you want to answer that, I just I got a a, a question um, about because uh, I had I had heard this recently that Kareem actually idolized uh, George Mikan, and that's why the one of yes. the reasons why he started to go and take that hook shot. Um, and I know that you said that Mikan was more of a banger than uh, than Kareem or Wemby, I guess, uh, ultimately. Um, and obviously, Wemby is not a, a huge person weight-wise. Um, do you think that he will actually, because I've heard that he's been trying to work on that skyhook, uh, obviously this is the very way-too-early um, prediction, but do you think that he'll actually start utilizing a hook shot and kind of combining the two arrows of, you know, this old school um, hook shot thing that people, because people don't do hook shots anymore practically um, or focus on them. There's a reason for that. I'll explain why. Nobody ever brings it up, but there is a reason why no one does a sky hook anymore. Okay. All right. What I just told you about that three to five second window, you know what a five second rule is, right? Yeah. Okay. So. You basically have five seconds to do what you're going to do with the ball Mm -hmm. Um, as your limit. The back to the The basket rule, right? Five Mm -hmm. five seconds back to the basket? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. uh, We're talking about uh, the sky hook. Yeah, yeah. If he gets in the post for a sky hook, the issue with the sky hook, if you watch, it's – it's basically a two or three count shot. Mm-hmm. If you count the beats, if you're if for all the point guards out there, you know what I'm talking about. Tempo. The beat of the ball is the rhythm of your offense. Dribble, 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 fast break, dribble, 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 dribble. That's 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 the pace of your team. You're running you're the drummer. You're keeping the beat of the offense. Your offense is ran. People make their cuts, people set their picks, people make their pop outs on the beat. Mm-hmm. That's that's the unison of it. The sky hook is a slow shot. Mm-hmm. The strength in the shot in the shot is the height that it is released from. Yeah. Since it is a slower shot, because you start with your back to the basket, you rotate your entire body ninety degrees. And it's the only shot that you shoot behind and above your head. You, The ball is not in your view when you're shooting the shot. It's behind and above your head. Yeah. With the quickness and length of modern players, remember how in the 90s even, you'd always see Jordan. He did it famously to Ewing repeatedly when Ewing had the jump hook. In that baseline turnaround, every time Ewing would take the baseline turnaround, 
Jordan would come down and swat it out of bounds yeah. from behind mm -hmm. because he, he would have the ball above and behind his head. You can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. So the traditional cream sky hook will rarely ever be used because if you're double teamed by a modern small forward, a 6'8 guy with a 4'5", 4, 4'6", 4, 40, and a near 7-foot reach, you're not getting that shot off. Yeah. Because you have to take your eye away from the, the guy that's sloughing down at you from the perimeter to look at the basket, but yet the ball, you don't have the ball between your body. Your, your body is between the ball and the man covering you. Mm -hmm. Not the help. Yeah. And if you turn to towards the middle of the court, you're turning directly into a double team. Now, back in the 70s, 60s, 70s, and 80s with Kareem, that wasn't an issue because he was a great passer. Yeah. And when you look at it, okay, if you got a center, if you're defending, you're the coach of the other team. Your center is covering Kareem. You say, okay, well, if he comes to the middle, we're double teaming with a big man. Yeah. If he if he turns towards baseline, then the guard that's out on that wing is going to double, mm -hmm. right? So you're either going with a little guard on the outside. If he turns to the middle of the lane, you're double teaming with a forward. Yeah. Okay. So that means with the Lakers, you're leaving Worthy open. Are you leaving Worthy open? No. So he didn't get that hard double team in the middle. They had to play him straight up because of the other guys on the team. Mm -hmm. Wemby doesn't have that privilege. Yeah. If he goes to do the sky hook and turns to the middle, he's going to meet someone like Draymond, someone like that, going to be sitting there right in the middle of the, of the lane waiting for him. Mm -hmm. And that that's when you start getting chucks on your hip and your knee, elbow in the ribs, and that's the type, that's the type of stuff that slows down tall, skinny, fast guys. Um, now, a jump hook, something more of what like Alonzo Mourning used to do, because mm -hmm. Alonzo Mourning, he bulked up during his career, and he lost some of his quickness. And if you ever notice, he, he looked very mechanical when he shot his shot, mm -hmm. robot-like. You might see a more fluid version of that, or even something more towards Samson's version. Mm -hmm. Where Samson had the sky jumper is what he called it. Yeah, that's what they called. That's what they called it in uh, Curry Kirkpatrick, the writer for Sports Illustrated, named it the sky jumper. Where he had Ralph Samson had a 38 inch vertical leap with seven foot four. Mm -hmm. So when he released his jump shot, he was actually his hand was a foot above the basket. Yeah, when he was shooting. Mm -hmm. So it's essentially the exact same effect of a sky hook. Except the ball is in front and above you, where the ball and the basket and the defender are all in, in your sight, which is what you want. They can't come over your back because you're just too big, the ball's too high, and it's a foul. That is more likely what you'll see. I mean, he'll, I'm sure he'll want the sky hook because all he'll have to do is hit one of them. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the other coach is going to go, is going to panic. Yeah. It's more it's more of a scare tactic in my opinion. He's not going to get 10,000 points on a sky hook like Kareem did. Defenses are different. The defensive schemes, defensive rules are different as far as help defense, zones and stuff like that. It's not going to be the same. So, understanding all of that what you're saying, the game has evolved where you just got guys that are too athletic in Wemby's case, he doesn't have the team for the hook shot. Um, and would you say though, for Kareem in the seventies, I mean, he still had a relatively good team. I, in my opinion, just not nearly as good as the Showtime Lakers. Do you think, uh, because a lot of people would say that he really didn't get his shot blocked a lot. Um, and like you said, uh, with the, with the defense, it was a little different. And you also had the option of somebody trying to double team you, uh, when he was on the Lakers, having somebody to pass it out. Do you think that, he had less success on the Bucks due to that, or do you think it has, or do you think it was just the team just plainly wasn't as good as the Lakers? It wasn't as good. You got, you know, they're the only 
expansion team, I believe that they they won the championship in three years. Yeah. They were they were an expansion team in '68. Drafted him in '69. Got to the Western Conference Finals in '70. Lost to the Lakers, who then lost to the Knicks, and then won the championship in '71. Mm-hmm. No, I don't believe any other expansion team has ever even come close to that. Yeah. But that was also at a time that a lot of guys jumped to the ABA. So it was a weakened era. Mm -hmm. You had talent split between two leagues. Yeah. You know, if you look at the guys like Mel Daniels, two-time ABA player of the year, first team all ABA, I believe, every year he was in the league. Mm -hmm. Kareem never had to go against him. Artist Gilmore, the poor man's Kareem, so to speak, went to the ABA. You know, that ended up in Chicago, you know, with Chicago. Mm -hmm. But once he was older and, you know, so Kareem really didn't have to deal with him very often. So it, it was, he had weaker competition. The guys that could physically match him athletically a lot of them went to the aba because the aba sat there and promised hey we're a run and gun league it's like the playground you get to go out and you get to run you get to do your thing we're not all tight and everything Mm -hmm. and remember a lot of people thought the the consensus before the draft was that kareem was going to go to the aba yeah because he's from new york Mm -hmm. the nets drafted him the Nets offered him an uh, outrageous kind. I believe it was a million dollar a year contract or a million dollars for two years or something like that. It was the highest contract. It would have been the highest contract any sports figure ever. And he said, "If I had a hundred, if I had a hundred chances, a hundred choices, ninety-nine of them, I would pick the Nets." But he understood finance. Kareem is a very intelligent man, and he did not believe in the ABA's long-term plan for success, Mm -hmm. and he didn't think it was going to last as a league. Thus, his money would not be guaranteed. Yeah. So he went with the Bucks. The NBA's biggest mistake in the history of the NBA is letting Kareem go to an expansion team. Yeah. No other all-time great and you knew he was an all-time great coming in there was no doubt he was going to be an all-time great it was obvious after his high school and college career everyone knew it Mm -hmm. and you let him go to an expansion team in the midwest with no tv deal yeah ridiculous Mm -hmm. absolutely ridiculous that's something that stern did away with when he took over that was not going to happen so anymore Yeah, and I mean, I think Kareem is way better than this guy I'm about to mention, but what about Shaquille O'Neal letting him... I know Orlando's got Disney and everything like that, but do you think that's an equatable um, letting Shaq go to that expansion team? Because I think it only came out, what, a year or two before he got there? Um, Um, No, and the reason why... Well, they came out, what, Orlando... Weren't they 88? They were 88... I, or 89. Okay. 89. Okay. I believe they were 88. They were 88 or 89. Mm-hmm. They're, they're one of the first four, I believe. Um, they Because their first draft, I remember because I had bullet season tickets. I was a Bullets fan. They took Terry Catledge mm-hmm. off the Bullets in the expansion draft. Um, Charlotte took Muggsy Bogues from the Bullets, <laughs> which broke my heart. <laughs> um. But the difference there was you had TV contracts. They had a large TV deal in place to get that team. Mm -hmm. That was part of their pitch to get the team in Orlando. It's a tourist capital. Yeah. People are going to 
during the summer, they're going to Disney, right? Going to Disney Land, Disney World. Yep. Disney World's Orlando, right? Okay. They're going to, I've even been there and I can't remember which is which. <laughs> They're going to Disney World. Okay. How do you keep, how do you still keep all those people to come in the winter? You can go to Disney World and then go see a magic game there in Orlando. You can go see two games over a three day weekend while you're staying to go to the park. It was part of the, the, what do you want to put it? The the show, mm -hmm. essentially. Yeah. It was part of the deal. Um, I mean, to show you how big basketball really is in Florida, I mean, they have two teams. They got two expansion teams, I believe, in like two years apart. Like one right after the other. Yeah. Who, do, who does that? What league does that? Yeah. You know, even baseball doesn't do that. So they had already proven that they were going to that the fans were going to be there. When you you look at the size of Orlando in the late 80s and the TV deal and the money in that area because of Disney World. That's that is not anywhere near the same animal as Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. Milwaukee got a team because they complained about losing the Hawks for years. Mm hmm. The Hawks started in Milwaukee, in St. Louis, then Atlanta. You know, it's like now. Now they're saying that uh, the NBA may expand again in 2025, and one of the team, one of the cities that's up for a possible possible team is Seattle. Yeah. Well, they had a team. It's Oklahoma City Thunder. Yeah. Well, but the fans have been clamoring and complaining and whining. I believe the, the Thunder still play a preseason game every year in Seattle, I believe. Still. Oh, I don't know, yeah. Because the, the, the town was livid that they left. Yeah. It's a real basketball pl place, you know. And it and so it was one of those things. That That's why the Bucks became something, because... The basketball people in that town, you know, we had a team. Y'all let it leave. It's your fault. You need to give us another one. So they gave them another one. Mm -hmm. And then they let the, the greatest player of a generation join an expansion team. Yeah. So then you had the whole court thing with Oscar Robertson to finally get him there. So And then you get Bobby Dandridge in there. And then there's your big three, you know, and there's the championship. And Dandridge ends up with the Bullets. They win a championship. Um, Oscar retires. Kareem gets disgruntled, uh, punches a stanchion, breaks his hand, misses a third of a season, demands to be traded to either L.A., New York, or Washington. Yeah. Then he pulled back on Washington. Um, why I don't know. I never heard. I never heard him explain why. First he wanted Washington, and then why he then pulled back and said no, it's New York or L.A. Mm -hmm. So they made the deal for L.A. People always sit there and, and cry, well, Kareem didn't deserve the MVP in 76 because his team didn't even make the playoffs. That's because a bunch of casuals don't understand the situation. L.A. had to trade half of their team. Mm -hmm. Half of the six players, 12-man roster, six players they traded for Kareem. So you got Kareem, you still have five empty spots that you got to fill with people that are not on your team the year before. Five, including Kareem, six new players that haven't played together. Free, limited free agency. Jerry West and Bill Charman did some major wheeling and dealing. Uh, I think kind of an underhanded deal they did with... Gail Goodridge to get the first draft pick that ended up being magic and then the draft pick being worthy. You know, they did 
he did like Red Auerbach type. It's kind of like the deal he did uh, with Pal Gasol. <laughs> yeah. You know that that was that was something that he really should have been suspended for. Mm-hmm. He's the Lakers GM for so long. He retires. He then takes the job at Memphis and trades the only good guy on the team to the Lakers and then retires from that job mm-hmm. yeah. and then goes back to the Lakers. Yeah. Yeah, it was, yeah, that was that was but that's the kind of stuff that Auerbach used to always do, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, um I know we talked a little bit about uh Mike and and Wembenyama. But do you think talent-wise just in general, obviously, you know, uh Mike and was a pioneer of the game. It was, you know, it was not as big on the on the national stage, a little on worldwide stage. Um, if you had to, uh, could you compare what you would ass- uh, assess their talents to be? Um, obviously, Wembenyama's a new talent in the league, um, but would you say that just Wembenyama is just plainly better than Mikan? Um, and I'm not specifically talking about just you know he can all his ball handling skills and long range three point shot and stuff like that but do you think well, that yeah the hard part is he he didn't go to college mhm he was he was playing pro as a teenager i don't know what he was taught i haven't seen enough the the little clips i've seen he does make a lot of rookie mistakes mm-hmm. but isn't he like 19 yeah 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 okay uh you know, George Mikan was a freshman at DePaul mm-hmm. for Ray Meyer at 19. Yeah. Totally different. Totally different thing. Mm-hmm. You know, remember back in the old days, that's one thing when people complain, say in the old days, well, you didn't have the, the highlight plays and all that. It was like, no, because you had grown men that had been playing together for many years and playing against each other for many years, playing each other. Mm-hmm. They all knew each other's moves. You know, when you have two great players, a lot of time the 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 rivalry fizzles out because they cancel each other out. Yeah, yeah. You had that at every position back then. Mm-hmm. They all knew each other. They all played each other, all high school, college, pro. They played, there was no split schedule, Eastern Conference, Western Conference. Since there were only eight, nine, ten teams in the league, for most of those years, you played every team nine or ten times. Yeah. So there were no surprises. By the time you got near playoff time, and when people say, oh, well, there was only this many rounds of the playoffs, you know, it wasn't as difficult. No, it was, you, you, it was just as difficult because you still had to beat those, team, those teams during the regular season to get to the playoff. Mm-hmm. So when you say, well, you only had to play two or three teams in the playoffs, yeah, well, the other guys that you would have been playing, you already beat them in the regular season. That's why they weren't in the playoff. Yeah. yeah. So you, you're still beating the same people, but it was a much more tighter game. That's why they got their advantage off pace. Mm-hmm. Because they couldn't get their advantage off head-to-head competition. Because it's very hard because of the rules. You didn't have the loose ball handling and loose footwork that... You know, back then that wasn't allowed. You know, the palming, the carrying, the move. You know, moving your pivot foot now is actually dragging it six inches, and they'll call you for moving your pivot foot. Back then, if literally, if you pivoted your foot and it came off that spot and rotated around like three inches, but you're still on the same spot, they'd call you for you know moving your pivot foot. Yeah. You know, it was very strict when you when you did a jump stop. That's why they that's why the jump stop used to be a thing, because doing a jump stop was the only way around the pivot foot rule Mm -hmm. that if you did a jump stop, if you took a dribble and then immediately one step landed both feet equally at exactly the same time, then you could use either foot as a pivot foot. Yeah, that's how tight the rule was Mm -hmm. back in middle school. You would. Three dribbles, jump stop. Yeah. Coach, blow the whistle. Three dribbles, left hand, jump stop. Blow the whistle. Three dribbles, right hand, jump stop. All the way up and down the court. Ten minutes. 
had to have your jump stop because that was the only way around the rule that the ref was not going to call you for traveling. Now, shoot, I saw Russell, Rus Russell Westbrook. I saw a highlight of him where he's holding the ball and he's pointing and yelling it to one of his teammates and he's actually taking steps. Yeah. Holding the ball, then mm. starts dribbling. And it's like, what is that? Yeah. <laughs> you know? But, you know, with how the rules were, Mike in was physically in a position to take advantage of the rules of the day. Mm -hmm. Today, Mike in, if he did not improve physically with modern times, if you just take the 1955 Mike in, well, that, he was old and beaten up by then, 1952 Mike in, and put him in today's game, he would be a lower level all star that's guaranteed to get you, you know, 17 and 12 every game, protect the basket, and set your hard picks to free up your, your main offensive weapon. Mm -hmm. That's what he would be today with the rules. Yeah. You take Wemby, put him back in that age, he struggles mm -hmm. because his game is not allowed back then. Literally, his moves are not allowed. Every time he touches it would be a, a, a travel. So he would be forced to play a post position, and he'd get broken in half by those rules. Yeah, yeah. So it's 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 just the rules of the day, mm -hmm. you know. It, de you know, people think you know, well, you know, great players always play great, but what people fail to give credit to is all the players in the league are great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's 569 NBA players this year, I believe. They're all great. Yeah. They they all can shoot. They all can dribble. They they all can run. They they all have huge lungs, and they're all very strong. They're very lean. They're they're in shape. You know, all of them. Yeah. That is a prerequisite to even be considered. It's not like when Barkley came in the league at 300 pounds. That guy does not get drafted today. Yeah. Look at Zion. Zion was the closest thing we've had in 20 years to Barkley. And how many games has he missed? Because he couldn't keep up with the fit guys on the court. He kept getting injured. Yeah. And was forced to lose all this weight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can't keep up. Same thing going backwards in the 60s when the pace got frenetic guys like Shaq guys like that they wouldn't have been they wouldn't have been able to be anywhere near as effective because of the rules of the day mm -hmm. Shaq wouldn't have been 325 yeah he would have been like 250 like he was at LSU because he would have been running up and down the court mm -hmm. with Nate Thurman and you know Russell and Chamberlain when he was young and he wouldn't have gotten that big. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Michael says the Lakers and Mikan's day were called the Yankees of basketball. Um, but. Yep. But one thing to remember. Um, when people think about the beginning of the sport, the beginning of the, the sport was 60 years old mm -hmm. in 1951. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. When you say it's popularity, it had been an Olympic sport since 1936. Okay. So it was played around the world. Mm -hmm. All right. The whole it did. The game went global, and, and I know that everyone, you know, it, everyone sits there and says, "Well, Bird and Magic made it popular, and then Jordan made it global." And that's not true. David Stern made it popular. David Stern made it global. Yeah. There's no there's no coincidence that he was put in charge of marketing and advertising for the NBA in 1980. Yeah. Then he became the outright commissioner in 84. Those are the exact same times when all this happened. Yeah. Yeah. He understood 
market the players, not the teams. It was always considered team game, team, team, team. You marketed teams. It's the Knicks. It's the Celtics. It's the Hawks. It's the Lakers. And he saw the benefit of, no, we need, we need to do like baseball and market the individuals. Mm-hmm. Our guys are right in front of you. They're not wearing helmets. They're not wearing caps. They're wearing shorts, tank tops. You can see their faces. You can see them sweat. When you go to a game, they're literally right in front of you. We need to market the players. Their their faces are recognizable. Mm-hmm. All of them. Do you know what the center for the Phoenix Cardinals, Arizona Cardinals, you know what the center looks like? You know what his face looks like? No. Exactly. No. But do you know what the, you know, I don't know what team you follow, but I... I remember you saying Spurs at one point. Do you know what the you know the you knew what the backup guard for the Spurs back in the 1990s looked like though, didn't you? Yeah. Because yeah. they're just they're right in front of you, and they're wearing shorts and a t-shirt. You can see them. You can see the face. You can see everything. Market that. Yeah. That's what that's what Stern did, and that's when everything exploded. Mm-hmm. I mean, league had Dr. J in the 70s. Pistol yeah. Pete. Kareem, don't act like there wasn't anybody that was popular. Dr. J might have been the the most popular athlete in the world until Stern took over and started actively pushing individual players. Yeah. Everyone knew who Dr. J was. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, But yeah, I, uh, I know that you have some obligations and it seems about that time what you said. Uh, and Yeah, I didn't know how you wanted to do it. I can always, last time, the last stream I was on, I kept talking while I drove to pick up my wife. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then all the way back, and then uh, finally ended when I got back to, the, got back, and we, I was in the house for like a half hour, and I finally had to go to sleep. Yeah. But whichever one do it, if you want to cut it off right now, that's fine. We can do a part two another time. Or if you want to continue, I can just go off camera and just go and do my thing and keep talking. It's up to you. Whichever you want. Yeah, let's uh let's let's try to do it again uh next week if you're available. Um I'll uh sure. I'll get with you. Um then we could keep talking about uh about the game, the history of the game. Um I'm glad that you're back, Rex. Thank you for coming. Um, for the people that are watching this, uh, uh, Rex's family has a podcast. It's linked on my community page. Um, I, uh, you want to talk about it a little bit or? Well, I haven't spoken to my wife specifically yet <laughs> about it, about pushing it out there. I think she'd be okay with it, mm-hmm. but basically what it was is my wife's sister was murdered 33 years ago. And big case, made national news at the time. Um, They eventually caught the guys. Uh, They're in prison. Uh, The thing my wife found out is there's all kinds of organizations. If you're the parent of a child that gets that gets murdered. Mm -hmm. But there's virtually nothing if you're the sibling. My my wife is the youngest child in the family and was living with the sister that got murdered. And there's nothing for siblings. There are no organizations, very few. There's there's nowhere to go to tell for to you know, find solace. In comfort with other people that know exactly what you're going through. So my wife has finally started with my daughter a podcast and a website where you can post pictures of your siblings, your loved ones that died in this manner and tell their story, put it up there for others in the same situation to see and to share stories, share grief, um, She'll be doing personal speaking engagements. She has one that's tentative for the future. That'll be posted on there. 
and just go forward with however, whatever comes out of it. It's just there to help. And we're going to try and get that off the ground here over the holidays. Well, I'm not, I don't go back to work until January. So I'm going to try and make this happen. Mm. Um, I'm not the most tech savvy individual in the house, but the one that is, is a full-time college student. So, you know, I got to try and figure it out. <laughs> yeah. And, and I know that um, uh, just uh, and I because I didn't want to put it out here like this. I know that you had uh, called in the other night uh, when I was having the uh, Michael Jordan golf cart live stream, um, golf cart side live stream. <laughs> um, but uh, are you okay with having people call in and having conversations with people? I know that that had been uh, love so- it. All right, um, love it, especially if they're asking about something I know about, like the history of the game. Don't. I just don't ask me about recent stuff. Mm-hmm. I don't follow the NBA. I don't follow basketball. I don't know who the starting point guard for Villanova University is. I don't know who the leading scorer for leading returning scorer for North Carolina is. You know, I don't. I don't know. I can't name three players on a single NBA team except, well, Golden State. I guess is the only team, or I guess now Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> So, other than them, I, I oh wait, no, I can name three guys on the Clippers. There you go. <laughs> um, I don't follow modern basketball. I love the history of basketball as a historian, not as a fan. Mm-hmm. I have no favorite team. I have no favorite player. I just, I just love the game, the way the game was invented, the way it was. How you want to say it? At, it, at its most competitive across the board. Mm-hmm. High school, college, pro, Olympic, where you got to see the best at every level. You know, now, if you look in the NBA, you see guys in the NBA two years ago, you have no clue who they were. Yeah. Never heard of them before. Then you, you Google them and you say, well, this guy went to University of Florida. Never heard of the guy. Well, now he's in the NBA. Mm-hmm. You know, aver- averaging double figures. You know, it's like that used to never be the case. Yeah. You know, it used to be you could follow a guy, you know, from high school. and You'd see him listed in, in the high school books, you know, and if you – played basketball and you went to basketball camps you'd play with some of the guys then seeing them at college if you were good enough to get to a college you might still play against them yeah you know then you see them go on to the pros and you see them playing with other guys that you saw ever since high school or saw their names ever since high school Mm -hmm. and it's a more it was a more you were involved more you weren't just a fan on the outside as you got to see the development of these players. Like I remember when Purvis Ellison in high school, he was an honorable mention all American. Yeah. He wasn't even, he wasn't listed in the top 50. Mm-hmm. And then he goes to Louisville, becomes an all American. He's doing fantastic. Then he ends up the first pick in the draft. And it's like, my God, I remember when he was a junior in high school and he wasn't even an all American and you got to see, his growth yeah. as a player, you know, and stuff like that. And then guys like Kareem that were front page news as sophomores in high school. Mm-hmm. For those of you that don't know, Kareem, then Luau Cinder, was seven foot tall on his 15th birthday. Yeah. He was first team All-American as a sophomore. You know, two-time high school player of the year. You know. Now, I was corrected because it's a uh, last night on something I said. This will be the last time, last thing I say. Um, it's a different organization now that does the high school awards. Yeah. So I didn't know that LeBron James was a two to- or three time high school All American because mm-hmm. he was actually named by a different organization, not by parade. Um. He was named first-team All-American by USA Today. 
Okay. But by Parade, who had been doing it since the 1950s, Parade had him as second team. Yeah. So if you count, if you count LeBron, you have LeBron, Kareem, and one other guy. Anybody know who it was? <laughs> no, or better yet, two-time LeBron, Kareem, and one other player was a two-time National High School Player of the Year. High School Player of the Year as a junior mm-hmm. and a senior. Who in the chat knows? Uh, it's it's kind of quiet. Michael's really been the only one that's been talking. Um, but... If I, I know, uh, you have a guess? If I, I know I was reading some stats about Bill Russell, but uh, I don't think he won National Player of the Year twice. Or are you talking about, I know he was an All-American twice. But. Yeah, but he wasn't, no. Uh, before him, Tom Gola. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Nope, it was Jerry Lucas. Okay. I actually talked about him in, my, in the debate. That's why I. That's why I wanted to see if you know when I when I saw that and I thought about. It, I'm like, you know, me and Dart were just talking about him a couple weeks ago. I want to see if Dart if he if he caught that. Yeah, I was, so, I, was I was paying more attention to Kareem and uh and, and I was just you know talking about the competition. I didn't look into his amateur accolades that hard. I just looked into his stats and you know his awards and stuff like that. So I didn't look into the amateur stuff uh, specifically. Amateur stuff is what's really interesting because you get to see a whole lot of background stuff. Yeah. Like for those of you that love the movie Hoosiers, mm-hmm. the real life story of that it was Muncie High or yeah, Muncie High was the high school that lost mm-hmm. to Milan. Oscar Robertson was on that team. He was on the team that lost. Yeah, I remember you were telling that story before. Um, but yeah. Yep. But but all right. But anyway, gotta go. But yeah, Rex, thanks for coming Just, back, and uh, um, yeah, and I'll get with you about coming on again, and uh, have a great rest of your night. You too. Thank you. Yep. Michael Jordan fans are the best. <laughs>